Hello everyone, Carlos here. So in today's video, we're going to be going over how does Sysmon track the creation of alternate data streams on the file system. Sysmon actually does this under event 15, and it is a technique that I have to be honest. I have been using this for a very, very long time. Actually, I remember started playing with this back in late 90s, early 2000s back in the day where most of my customers had, were actually running Windows NT4 and Windows 2000 was actually coming into the scene that, it that was one of the methods that we actually used to hide our tools inside of the file system. The way it works is that under NTFS, we have multiple attributes that NTFS supports for files. The default one being dollar sign data, that is where the file stores its data, and we can actually add named attributes to an existing file on the file system. So the way that we abused this was that we created another attribute and under that attribute, we actually stored our tools. So it would store Netcat, NetBIOS auditing tool and scripts and many other tools actually. Uh, throughout the years is still a feature of NTFS that actors still use for hiding files. And also as programs and the internet has progressed, we have found other uses for it. For example, when you download something from the web and you hear that term mark of the web, which is that it specifies that the file was actually downloaded from the internet, that's actually an attribute called zone identifier. That attribute is going to contain the URL of from where that file was actually downloaded from what internet zone and everything. Uh, so this, that's super useful for us. If we want to track somebody doing phishing attacks in our environment, we can actually track them uh, using that. So we are collecting all of that information, then we can aggregate it and then look at the different zones that were created and just start hunting from there from where could an attacker could actually have gained a foothold? Uh, in the case of a downloaded file, it will actually throw the process of both your email client and your browser is going to create multiple entries. So let's go in and look at how can we capture all of this information and how does it look in the logs? So on this host, I have a configuration file here for file create stream hash that is set to unmatch exclude for this event type, but no filters inside. That means that all events are actually going to match and they're going to be included inside of the event lock. I can confirm that this configuration has been applied by doing sysmon minus C. And here we can see file create stream hash, unmatch exclude. So everything's going to be included. So what I'm going to do is list the files here and I can just look at the alternate data streams by doing get item and PowerShell. I'm going to look at the WPE file here and I'm going to specify a stream and I want to see them all. As you can see, I only have the default data stream for the file. Now, what happens, let's say to Sysmon, which is a file that I'm downloaded initially on this machine. Let's take a look at that one. If I look right now at sysmon.sip, we're going to see that I have what it's called a zone identifier. I can actually look at from where this file came from. That is something that browsers and email clients add. So I have that alternate data stream there. If I want to look at the content of it, I can get, do get content stream. I'm going to actually copy paste this zone identifier so I don't do a typo. And then I'm going to specify the file sysmon.sep. And when we get that content, we can see that it was zone ID three, referrer URL, learnmicrosoft.com, host URL, download sysinternals.com, file.sysmon.sep. Now let's say that I want to hide that PowerShell script inside of the sysmon executable as a, or the sysmon zip file as an alternate data stream. I want to hide it in one of its streams. 
The way I would actually do that is first, I'm going to get the content. I'm going to do script file. I'm going to do get content. I want it all raw. And then I'm going to specify the file wpe.ps1. So that way it doesn't add a carriage return at the end. It doesn't return an array by using the dash raw parameter. So now that I have the script there, I can do set item or set content. Stream, I'm going to give it a name. PS script, I'm going to call it. I'm going to set the value to my script that I download, that I got the content from. And I forgot to specify the file to do it. So let me set this mod that set. Now that that's done, let's see if Sysmon actually caught this as an event 15, which is the event ID for stream hash. Get Sysmon. Called stream hash. And here you can see that it actually caught me setting that stream on the sysmon.sip file. It actually created even a hash of the content of what I did. Here you can see that it also has the name PS script. So it actually caught that action. Now, one of the best resources when it comes to actually working uh, with alternate data streams, if you are looking for examples, stuff that you want to emulate, is a gist from a coworker of mine. So let's take a look at that. Here I have one of the best resources I have found on the different ways that I, I can actually abuse alternate data stream. This is by a coworker of mine. His name is Otvar Mo, and this is his gist, xc underscore ads underscore methods. When we go here, we can see all of the different ways that I can actually add content to an alternate data stream. He covers multiples of those, uh, how to extract content from alternate data streams, execution with WMIC, run Delta 32, CS script, four files, Mavin Jack, MSHDA, control.exe, and many more. In fact, he's the creator of the LOL BIM project. So that's why he has quite a nice collection over here. The link for this specific gist is going to be included in the description of the video. So as you saw, we're able to track and find all of these actions quite easily on the file system. But um, I have to say, in a regular environment, if we're tracking every user, it's going to be a lot of information. Uh, so it's going to depend amount on the amount of storage. Uh, users are constantly downloading attachments or constantly downloading files from the internet. If you can still save that information, I would say do it. If not, if, if it is a concern in terms of space, I would say normalize what are the common applications that are downloading from the internet, exclude those, and then just look for those outliers in the normal behavior. Uh, the normal attackers are, or the normal images, that would be the field that we would filter on, it would be on image, would be email clients and web browsers. Um, I think this is one of those events that if you do have the storage available, do log and do capture the events specifically for the zone identifier. I think the value is worth, uh, it's worth it to be honest. Well, I do hope that you have found this video useful and again, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.